two numbers, zero and one. Do we truly understand what they are? What is zero? What is one? To go further, what is a number? We may think we understand what numbers are, but in reality, we don't. We say there is one apple, then two, then three. In total, three apples. So, what exactly is this three? These are three apples, but they are not the three itself. Even if we replace apples with oranges, three is still three. Does something called three exist independently of things like apples? Let us consider a different perspective. The number two can be expressed as one plus one. This can be interpreted as breaking two down into the more fundamental number one. Another example of this kind of breakdown is pi, which is expressed as an infinite decimal, 3.141592, and so on. It might look complicated, but each digit is represented by one of the fundamental numbers from 0 to 9, so pi can also be broken down digit by digit into more fundamental numbers. In this way, many numbers can be broken down into more fundamental ones. What does fundamental mean? What does it mean to break down? Those questions arise, but let's set them aside for now. Now then, what about 0 and 1? Can they be broken down into more fundamental numbers? 0 and 1 are the most fundamental numbers, so it seems that there are no numbers more fundamental than them. Then what exactly are 0 and 1? To answer the question of what numbers are, we at least need to uncover the true nature of 0 and 1. But, 0 is 0, and 1 is 1. Can there really be any explanation beyond that? Are numbers simply numbers? And are we not supposed to question their existence? In fact, there is one thing we can say for sure. A deeper, more fundamental concept lies behind numbers. And that is, yes, this very awareness you are now experiencing. Now then, let's begin mathematics in a world where numbers have been lost. Sundaman, wake up! Sundaman! Um... I feel like I was having a weird dream. Are you okay? Wasn't there something you wanted to ask me? Oh right, that's true. I've got a question about differentiation today. Differentiation? What is it? What? Well, it's about differentiation in calculus. Calculus? I've never heard that word before. Seriously? Metan, you've taught me so many things about differentiation already. Differentiation is... Wait, what was it again? Whoa, what's happening? At that moment, I felt all mathematical concepts starting to vanish. Differentiation, integration, vectors, and numbers. All mathematical concepts disappeared. No, something must still be there. I feel like I was talking to someone just now. Who was it? I can't remember. And now there's nothing here. In this empty world, the only thing I'm sure of is that there is nothing. Let's represent this nothingness as zero. This is all I can do for the moment. But I feel like everything will begin from here. For now, let's think of this as a collection of things, a set. Zero is a set that contains no elements. Using curly brackets, it can be written like this. Since it contains no elements, there's nothing inside the brackets. That's right, I remember now. This is called the empty set, and it's often represented by this symbol. Well this time, let's use curly brackets to represent the empty set. In short, let's define zero as the empty set. What? What am I even thinking? This is zero? That's totally different from the zero I know. Wait, did I even know what zero was to begin with? Well, whatever. Let's keep moving forward. Next, I want to define something called one. I don't know why, but I just felt like defining one after zero. Right now, all I have is the zero I just defined. Then I guess the only way to define one is like this. In other words, one is a set composed only of zero. Um, if I remember right? Since I defined zero as the empty set, if I write it with just brackets, it looks like this. It still feels kind of empty, but one definitely contains zero as an element. All right, next is... Ah, I've got my body back! Well, well done, done Sandman! That voice? You're... uh... Next, define two. Two. That word sounds familiar. I define zero and one. Then, for two, this seems like a good way to define it. 
So 2 is a set composed of 0 and 1. And if I use brackets to represent 0 and use brackets for 1, 2, then 2 will be represented with just brackets like this. It still feels kind of empty though. Cinnamon, you're doing great. You are, Natan. I'm glad you remembered me. Why couldn't I remember until just now? Well, whatever. Anyway, we've obtained the natural numbers. Zero is the empty set. If you add zero itself as an element, you get one. Then, by adding one itself, you get two. And by adding two itself, you get three. This process continues in the same way. Each set constructed this way is called a natural number. Let's include zero as a natural number here. Actually, this explanation is somewhat simplified. To construct the natural numbers more rigorously, you need to start from the foundational assumptions called axioms in mathematics. Just keep that in mind. Huh, that sounds kind of hard. By the way, 0, 1, 2, 3, they're really just names, right? What they actually are is hollow structures built from the empty set. Hmm, thinking about it again. Calling these natural numbers feels kind of weird to me. That's understandable, but in a way, this definition does feel natural. Zero has zero elements. One has one element. Two has two elements. And so on. So n has n elements. From this, the idea of the number of elements comes naturally. Uh, what do you mean? For example, suppose we have a set called x. x has the elements a, b, and c. And let's assume that a, b, and c are all distinct. Then we'd like to say, X has three elements. Yeah, that's true. But there's a problem with that. Um, why? It sounds like you're just stating the obvious though. Look carefully, Cindamon. You see the term three elements being used here, right? So what exactly does three elements mean? Three elements is just three elements. There's no other way to say it. Well, yeah, but still. The three we defined earlier is just a set built from the empty set. So the term three elements doesn't actually have any meaning yet. We still can't use the everyday concept of number of elements. Wait, we have to think about that too? Well, that's what it means to define numbers from scratch. The three we know is just a set that includes zero, one, and two. Of course, zero, one, and two are also sets built from the empty set. So how can we use this three to express that X has three elements? Hmm, what should we do? Wait a second, looking closely, x and 3 have the same number of elements. So saying x has 3 elements can be restated as x has the same number of elements as 3. Yes, you're getting really close. Then what does same number actually mean? Well, obviously it means both have 3 elements. Ah, you use the phrase 3 elements again, but it's okay. Just rephrase same number as a 1 to 1 correspondence between elements. Actually, even though 1 to 1 includes the number 1, you can think of it as a matching without duplicates or omissions to avoid using 1. Oh, I get it now. So this is what it really means to say X has 3 elements. Of course, the same applies to natural numbers other than 3. And just like that, we've acquired the concept of the number of elements. Wow, so that's how you think about it? Creating numbers is really hard. By the way, since the empty set has no elements, does that mean we can't even consider a correspondence involving it? Good observation. You're right. With the empty set, you can't define any correspondence between elements. But for convenience, let's assume the empty set has an empty correspondence with itself. Since we've defined zero as the empty set, we can now say the empty set has zero elements. Well, it might be clearer to say the number of elements is zero. Paul, huh, that's pretty interesting. Also, natural numbers have another structure, order. Wait, do we also have to define the order from scratch? Exactly. Saying 2 is less than 5 seems obvious. But here, 2 and 5 are just sets. So the meaning of that inequality hasn't been defined yet. So we need to define the order using relationships between sets. That's right. Hey, have you noticed something? Hmm, not really. Oh, wait. 2 is actually an element of the set for 5. If we use set notation, we can write it like this. Well, I guess that's not really related. That's actually an important point. Since 5 is the set containing all numbers before it, being less than 5 means being contained in 5. 
So when we say 2 is less than 5, we're really saying 2 is an element of 5. More generally, for natural numbers n and m, we say that n is less than m, if and only if n is an element of m. So we can define n is less than m as n is an element of m. We've now acquired the concept of order for natural numbers. And that's how we constructed natural numbers from nothing. There are countless methods to construct natural numbers, but this one is considered standard. What? Standard? Hmm, but I feel like there must be a simpler method. For example, to find zero as the empty set. Then by gradually adding more brackets, you could define natural numbers one after another. You're right. That method can define natural numbers too. And it definitely looks a lot simpler. But in that case, all natural numbers other than zero would just be sets with one element each. That would lose the nice property we had earlier, where n had n elements. You, you're right. I kind of get why this method is considered standard. Wait, I'm getting sleepy again. Now, we've managed to build up natural numbers from the empty set. But, can we really say that? Can we truly accept the idea that numbers are just sets? This feels very different from the image of numbers we originally had in our minds. It almost seems like something else entirely. Still, there's one thing we can definitely say. That is, the structure of these natural numbers satisfies the piano axioms. Simply put, the piano axioms describe the minimum requirements for a structure to qualify as the natural numbers in mathematical terms. To explain this intuitively, first, there's a natural number called zero. Each natural number has a next natural number. There is no natural number before zero. There are no branches or loops. Every natural number can be reached starting from zero. In short, it's a line-like structure from zero. The piano axioms state these conditions more precisely. The natural numbers after zero correspond to one, two, three, and so on, but we haven't actually named them yet. The piano axioms don't define the numbers themselves, but describe the structure of natural numbers. It doesn't matter how the numbers are built. As long as something satisfies that structure, we can call it the natural numbers. To put it strongly, we could say that natural numbers are not things, but a structure. Anyway, we've now given a clear construction of natural numbers. From here, we can define addition and multiplication and construct the integers from the natural numbers, the rational numbers from the integers, and the real numbers from the rational numbers. But here, let's take a completely different path. We define natural numbers step by step. 0, 1, 2, 3. What could lie beyond this sequence? With each step, we add one more element. So at the far end of this infinite process, we might consider a number like this. Let's call this number omega. Talking about moving infinitely far might sound suspicious. But in reality, omega is just the name we give to the set of all natural numbers. According to our earlier definition of order, contains means greater than. So omega is greater than any natural number. You can think of it as representing infinity. Then, is there anything beyond that? Can we imagine a next number after omega? To do that, let's recall what a next number means. For example, 3 is a set that contains 0, 1, and 2. If we add 3 itself as an element, we get to number 4. Let's apply the same idea here. Omega is the set that contains all natural numbers. Now if we add omega itself as an element, we get a set called omega plus 1. This is the next number after omega. Since omega is contained in omega plus 1, we can say that omega is smaller than omega plus 1. But here's something strange. Omega and omega plus 1 are actually the same size. In other words, they have the same number of elements. That may seem like a contradiction. To explain this, let's match the elements of the two sets one by one. So first, let's move omega to the front inside omega plus one. At first, omega plus one looks like it has more elements. But if we match each element one by one, that one extra element just gets absorbed into the endless structure of infinity. So omega and omega plus one have the same number of elements. To be exact, we say their cardinality is the same. Even though it's the next number in order, they're equal in size. Strange things happen in the world of infinity. Now then, what lies beyond that? 
The number after infinity? We could describe this more precisely using the idea of ordinal numbers in set theory, but for now, let's take a look at the endless world beyond. Just like we thought about the next number after omega, we can also think about the one after that. And then the next one after that? If we keep repeating this, not in any finite number of steps of course, we are led to a number called omega plus omega. We write this as omega times 2. We can again think about the next number. And then the next. Following this path endlessly, we're led to the number omega times 2 plus omega. We write this as omega times 3. If we keep going like this, we get omega times 4. Then omega times 5. And eventually, a number called omega times omega. We write this as omega squared. And of course it goes on. Omega cubed. Omega to the fourth. And far beyond that. Eventually we reach the number omega to the power of omega. We've come unimaginably far. But we can't stop here. Beyond this, infinity continues forever and ever.